of course. Um, cardiovascular system. So, you know, whenever we start new systems, we usually like to talk about the overall functioning and role that it plays. What are things that cardiovascular system is doing for you? Pumping your blood. Um, I would say that that's kind of, you know, description, a mechanical description, but why is that useful? What's the point of pumping your blood? To deliver oxygen and nutrients. So a big part of what it's doing is it's delivering oxygen and nutrients. So or I should, maybe I should say transport. You know, oxygen, nutrients. What other kinds of things does it transport? Waste. Wastes as well. It's not just about bringing in the good stuff. It's getting rid of the bad stuff. Wastes, you know, carbon dioxide, you know, waste, waste, you know, gases as well. What other things does it transport? Hormones. Transports hormones. This is the way that a major way you just you communicate between different parts of the body is dump signaling molecules into the bloodstream and have them distributed to other places. So it transports hormones. Um, what are other roles the cardiovascular system plays? Uh, regulation. Thermal, Healing. Thermal regulation. Temperature. So temperature, temperature regulation. You know, we'll talk about this more, but you can vary the amount of blood flow to your surface by like 50 fold. So if you're trying to conserve heat, you'll keep your blood near your core. If you're trying to cool off, you'll put a lot more blood near the surface to radiate out heat. So it's important for temperature regulation. Um, what other roles does this thing play? Immune response, like white blood cells. Yeah, so it's like, sometimes we'll say like a staging area for the immune system. You know, when we get to the white blood cells, we'll see that most of them aren't in your bloodstream even, but that's how they, they, a lot of them move around in your bloodstream. And when they see there's a problem, they get these chemical messages and they'll actually ooze out of the blood vessel and into the tissue spaces and take care of business. So, you know, it's a place where a lot of um, important immune system um, cells and other stuff actually kind of can be, but it's not the only place you find them, but that's what it's, I say like staging area. All right, so let us talk a little bit more about this idea of um, you know, why do we need the cardiovascular system to transport everything? You know, and it comes down to what we saw in that you know demonstrations in diffusion lab. Um, this is why I like you know doing that lab where you had the petri dish with a little bit of the you know, the dye in there, like the methylene blue or the potassium permanganate. Like after you waited a couple of hours, how far did the dye diffuse out? You're just waiting for diffusion. Do you remember this lab at all? Mm -hmm. Remember it was a petri dish. And you put the either the methylene blue or the potassium permanganate in the middle, and then you timed it after a half an hour, after an hour. It went like four millimeters or something. Yeah, it after you've waited like an hour, it's gone. No, it hasn't gone very far. If you're just waiting for diffusion, so part of why we do that diffusion demonstration is just so you get this real sense. You know, diffusion is good if you're looking at really small distances like across a synapse, a synapse is like 40 billionths of a meter across. You know, there the neurotransmitter diffuses across just fine and enough, you don't have to wait. But if you're waiting for something to diffuse more than a fraction of a millimeter, you're gonna be waiting a long time. So if you are, 
you know, like Andy the amoeba or, you know, Percy the paramecium, a little single celled animal. You don't need a cardiovascular system because you're one cell big and all of the molecules that you need can just diffuse in and out of you. But as soon as you start getting creatures that are bigger than microscopic, then you run into trouble. And the way that you usually have larger creatures is these big multicellular creatures. So instead of having just you know an amoeba become a super amoeba, instead you end up getting you get lots of little cells to make up the big creature. And then you have a cardiovascular system that carries oxygen and nutrients to within a fraction of a millimeter of all those cells. So it's a big creature, but it's made out of lots of little cells and each cell is really close to a blood vessel that is supplying the oxygen and nutrients at a very close distance. So diffusion is gonna work to move things where it needs to be. So that's kind of this idea of the cardiovascular system is you've got this crazy network, like literally, uh, what is it? How many, you, you have millions, not millions, like tens of thousands of miles. Um, where do I, I think it is. 60,000 miles of blood vessels in your body. That's a lot, um, like a hundred kilometers, if you want to do it in kilometers. Um, just kind of putting that out there, you've got this crazy amount of blood vessels just going within a fraction of a millimeter of every cell so then diffusion will work to have oxygen get delivered and nutrients and wastes get picked up and removed. Um, you know, when we get to the respiratory system next, it's gonna be about the blood is in the lungs where there's a very, it, oxygen diffuses from the alveolar line of the bloodstream and then gets transported right up to the cells where then diffusion is, can deliver it to the cells. So that kind of gives you this idea of you know, why we need a cardiovascular system. So now we'll look at more kind of the details of how this thing works. Um, obviously, it's mainly gonna be about the heart, the blood vessels and the blood. Um, so let's start by laying out the basic um, layout of the cardiovascular system. And then we're gonna get into all the different kind of physiological details and concepts you need. Um, you know, in anatomy, I get much more, um, much more detailed about the actual heart. You know, for this class, we are just going to let the heart be this more schematic thing. The real heart is, um, you know, if you're trying to find where is this ventricle or that ventricle, this atrium or that atrium, it's not as neatly laid out as my drawing here, but I'm going to do this for our class. In fact, I'll even make it look like a heart. So there's no, obviously a heart. Um, so it's important to remember that there are two halves to it. There's the left half and the right half and it's two pumps working in parallel. There's the atrium, which is kind of where blood comes in. Then it kind of gets moved down into the ventricle. The ventricle is the main pumping chamber. We'll talk about this more, but basically the atrium is like the entry room. Most of the blood that comes into the atrium just flows all the way through and goes down into the ventricle. It's not like the blood goes into the atrium and then gets squished into the ventricle. 
most of the blood coming into the atrium just flows through. We'll see at the beginning of the actual cardiac cycle, there's a squeeze of the atrium, atrial systole, which will squeeze out the last little bit of blood that's still remaining there. But it's only like, you know, 15% of the total volume that ends up in the ventricle. Um, so the atrium is, it's not, so don't think of the atrium as the atrium fills and then moves to the ventricle. It's more the atrium is there as the blood's returning and as the heartbeat starts, the atrium squeezes out any last bit that's in there. Um, the ventricles, the main pumping chamber. And again, on the left side, it's pumping out to what we call systemic circuit of circulation. Which is just going to the entire body. What I meant to do. Systemic circuit, meaning basically to all of your body tissues. Um, the place where the actual exchange happens, you know this from other classes, the capillary beds. We'll talk about capillaries in much more detail, but basically that's where materials leave or enter the blood. Those capillary beds. Um, the convention is always to draw oxygenated blood in red. So the fact that I drew this in, back in red, I'm implying that the blood in here is oxygenated. I'm delivering oxygenated blood to my cells of my body. Um, and again, this is on the left side. So this left ventricle is pumping out to the systemic circuit. Um, you know, after I have deliver the oxygen. And we're gonna see that this is actually, it's not like here you don't actually even deliver all the oxygen. Usually the blood coming back is still loaded. It's got like 75% of its original oxygen. We're gonna look at this in more detail later. But you can think about it, deoxygenated blood. It's given up the oxygen. Um, hemoglobin that has less oxygen bound to it is darker in color. It's not really blue, but through your skin, it looks kind of blue. So this blue is going to be the deoxygenated blood, going to return to the heart, but come in onto the other side. Um, So this is one circuit. This is a systemic circuit, sending blood out from the left ventricle to pretty much most of the body, and then bringing the blood back to the other side. Um, some terminology you need to know. Any vessel that is leaving the heart is gonna be called an artery. arteries leave the heart and any vessel that is returning to the heart is going to be a vein. Um, in the systemic circuit, the arteries are red and the veins are blue, but that's not always the case. In fact, we're going to see in the other circuit, it's the opposite. So be careful, a lot of people get messed up when they um, make these assumptions about veins and arteries being red and blue. So the blood that has returned to the heart after delivering the oxygen and nutrients to the systemic circuit is coming back. The blood comes in and now it's in the right ventricle. Where does the blood go from the right ventricle? lungs. 
to the lungs. So the, what we go, what we call the pulmonary circuit. Let me try to draw the lungs here. And again, we have capillaries there in the pulmonary circuit, but instead of delivering oxygen here, we're picking up oxygen. So we pick up oxygen, and then as we pick up oxygen, we are now going to be, you know, red, and that's going to be what comes back here into the um, into the left atrium here. So and again, if I draw my arrows to be clear. So this up here, this is my pulmonary circuit. I kind of left, didn't leave myself enough room here. So this is this is kind of messy here. Um, in fact, maybe I should draw this a little prettier. Your blood goes out to the body. comes back into here. Blood leaves through the right ventricle to the lungs. Picks up oxygen, comes back over here. So this is kind of the two main circuits. Um, they're both happening at the same time. That's going to actually be important. Um, it's not like the blood starts here, moves around. It's like every time the heart beats, both sides, left and right ventricles are squeezing. So with every heartbeat, you're pumping oxygenated blood out. This And this, this major artery leaving here is the aorta. Um, this is the pulmonary trunk going into the pulmonary arteries. Um, with every heartbeat, you are sending, you are sending blood out to the lungs. With every heartbeat, you are also sending blood out the aorta to the systemic circuit. Um, and because these two things are intertwined, both of those flows coming out of the left and the right ventricles going into the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit, both of those flows have to be balanced because every drop of blood pushed out to the systemic circuit is returning back here into the right side. And everything pushed out onto the right side is coming back onto the left side. So if you were pushing more out on one side than the other, you would start getting backup pressure building on one side or the other. So with every heartbeat, the volume of blood leaving the right and left ventricles is exactly the same. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about it in more detail. It's called the stroke volume. As you let the heart keep beating and just look at the volume, the flow leaving, per second is gonna be balanced. The flow leaving on either side is gonna be exactly the same because otherwise you'd have backup pressure building on one side or the other. The blood pressure is gonna be very different. We'll talk about why, but kind of remembering that the flow has to be balanced on both of these sides or else you're gonna have pressure building up on one side or another. We're gonna talk about that more. It's called congestive heart failure. Um, yeah, if, if it's not going. Um, there are two other circuits that we should put in here. 
Um, another circuit that is essential is the coronary circulation. Obviously the heart itself is a very metabolically hungry organ. And if it's not getting its supply of oxygen and nutrients, nothing else is gonna survive. So right off of the base of the aorta here, there are blood vessels that come and go right back up into the heart muscle. And these are called the coronary arteries. So the coronary arteries are basically, they come right off the aorta and go supply the heart muscle directly there. So that way the heart gets first dibs on the blood flow to keep itself happy. So everything else is gonna get what it needs. Um, what happens if there's a blockage and blood is having trouble getting through a coronary artery? A heart attack. Yeah, that's a heart attack. Necrosis. So if, if you start get so there's two, two things that can happen. If it's temporary, kind of like a, you can have a TIA, a temporary ischemic attack in the heart, just like you can have the same thing in the brain. If you have a temporary ischemic attack in the heart, it's called angina pectoris. Um, Um, that's like it's crushing pain, but then it resolves as the blood flow comes back. Um, if the blood flow is blocked long enough, then you do start getting necrosis. You start getting tissue death. Then you get like what we call like MMI, myocardial infarction. Dr. Eger, I can't see what you're typing. I don't know if it's... Oh, yeah, Stop. No, I Oh, okay. It's on the very bottom. Is there any way you can move it up just a little bit? I'm trying right now. Okay. Thank you. Um, there you can have it. Oh, there we go. So basically, if you have the blood flow cut off, and what's an, another word for myocardial infarct is just like, you know, you're having a heart attack and then your, your heart tissue is starting to die there. Um, so the coronary arteries are obviously essential. Um, there's one other circuit that we should bring in here that's going to be important when we get, to, especially to the digestive system. So both of these circuits, or actually all of these, these three circuits that I've drawn here so far are just simple, simple loops where you go, you go use a artery to get to the capillaries. You have a capillary bed where you exchange materials and then a vein that comes back to the heart. So systemic pulmonary and coronary circulations all are just out and back. Um, there's one other type of circuit that we get, which are called portal systems. We're going to see three of them before the semester is done. Um, I'll start by describing the hepatic portal system, just because that's the one we're going to need um, right away or sooner than the others. So portal system. So the first capillary bed drains into a second capillary bed before returning to the heart. So let me kind of give you a sense of how this looks. So let's say here's the heart. Let's just for ease of description here, let's just look at the systemic circuit right now. <clears throat> 
Okay, so this is kind of what we were talking about. There's blood coming out to the capillary bed and then returning back to the heart. Um, food or things, it, the, the capillaries in your digestive tract though are actually have a different kind of setup. So the ones in your digestive tract, they go out and you have a first capillary bed in your digestive organs. So digestive viscera, this is like your small intestine and your stomach and all that. Um, those, that blood doesn't just go back to the heart. Um, this is where you're picking up nutrients, you're bringing stuff into your body. So the next step is actually going to be going to the liver. The liver is where you can detoxify things that need to get detoxified. It's where you store nutrients. It's where you transform things. It's where you clean things and filter things. So this is actually rather than going to the heart, it's going to go into a second capillary bed before returning to the heart. Uh, let's put that, use my text tool. This is going to be liver. So this is capillary bed number one. This is capillary bed number two. And this vessel, this is the hepatic portal vein. This thing that I've drawn here, this is called the hepatic portal system. this idea that the blood going to the capillary beds in the, in the um, digestive organs does not go just back into general circulation. First, it goes to the liver for processing, then goes into general circulation. So there is this hepatic portal vein, which takes you actually to the liver. And then finally, the, the hepatic vein, which is going to actually finally dump back into normal circulation. Um, this is why uh, there's a lot of drugs that don't work orally, right? If you're taking a drug orally and absorbing it through the walls of your digestive tract, it first goes to the liver and the liver might be just break it down before it ever has a chance to actually be active in your body, right? There's some drugs that you have to inject that you can't take orally because if you take them orally, they get broken down in the liver before they can actually get into your bloodstream proper. So if you're trying to get something in your bloodstream and bypass the liver, um, there's a few ways. You can also do like, you know, rectal suppositories. Um, you can do a, you know, thing or sublingually under your tongue. There's ways transdermally to get, get things into your bloodstream, avoiding getting the, um, getting things broken down by the liver. But in general, if you just swallow something, it's going to go through the gauntlet of the liver capillaries where there's all sorts of processing and detoxification before actually ending up in your bloodstream. So does that make sense, this idea of a portal system? Um, we're going to also see a portal system in the kidneys. Um, the way the nephrons work in the kidneys is going to be a first capillary bed in the glomerulus where you create the filtrate going into a second peritubular capillary bed where we actually reabsorb and secrete stuff to actually do all the magic that the kidneys do. When we get to the endocrine system, we're going to find the hypophysial portal system where you have this direct delivery of controlling hormones from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary gland. So there's going to be a couple of other portal systems in addition to the um, hepatic portal system, but this is the one we're going to see next. So, and it's a, it's a, it's kind of the most um, obvious one. Um, 
So we will we'll come back to this later. But again, you have to think about it both in terms of absorbing your nutrients, but also in terms of the efficacy of kind of oral drugs, because anything you put into your body through your mouth is going to go through the liver before actually getting absorbed into your bloodstream. Um, all right. So this is kind of the big layout. Um, I'm going to be talking a lot more about the heart. And in fact, our lab today is going to be getting into the um, details of kind of the coordination of the heartbeat that's pumping the blood out. But now what we got to do is kind of put, this is kind of more of our anatomy hat. Now we're going to like put on our physics hat. We need to kind of talk about physics of fluid flow. Um, Cause ultimately that's what's driving all of this is a few basic concepts around pressure, around flow, around resistance to flow. So we need to look at all three of those in more detail and how it relates to all of this that we've been talking about. So some definitions. Flow. Flow is just liters per minute that is moving past something. Um, flow is not the same as the speed, right? So for instance, I can have some pipe and some water coming out, blue, blue, blue. I could have one liter per minute coming out of this pipe and it's going glop, 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 filling up my bucket. One, if I wait a minute, I'll have had one liter. If I have that same flow in a really small pipe, it's got to come out really fast. It's still one liter per minute. If I wait one minute, I'll still get a liter. But if I look at this, this is going to be much faster. So this is not equal to velocity or speed, right? Not equal. Um, so flow is the amount per unit time, right? This is how come you, if you're, if you've all done this, where you have your garden hose and it's got a certain flow, bloop, 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 bloop. And then all of a sudden you see somebody and you want to drench them and you put your thumb over the, you know, over the, the thing and reduce the aperture there. And now for that flow to continue out, it has much more speed and goes much farther before gravity pulls it down. So you can actually spray somebody far away. You're basically increasing the speed by decreasing the aperture, but the flow is staying the same. So flow, liters per minute, not speed. Uh, when we talk about the overall flow, sometimes we're going to look at flow just kind of in a local area, like what's happening in this little region of the body, the amount of flow. When we're looking at the flow of the overall cardiovascular system, like all the liters per minute coming out of the heart, then we call it the cardiac output. And the reason why it's out of either ventricle is because like I said, the amount that comes out of one side has to be balanced by the other side or else you're gonna get that backup pressure, the congestive heart failure. So kind of back to this picture here, with every heartbeat, you have to have the exact same amount of blood coming out of this side as coming out of this side because everything coming out of this side is returning over here and everything coming out of this side is returning over here. So every heartbeat has to have the same amount of blood. The overall flow um, liters per minute has to be balanced on the two sides or else they are gonna have this backup. So that is why when we talk about cardiac output, the flow is we say the flow out of either ventricle because it has to be the same in the left or the right ventricle. And again, when we're talking about 
you know, overall blood pressure or over, you know, control of your mean arterial pressure in your body, we'll be using cardiac output as our kind of big kind of overview idea of flow of the cardiovascular system. We will also be doing like local auto regulation of blood flow and stuff, in which case we'll be looking at much more um, kind of local rather than the big picture of flow through the whole system. But cardiac output is this flow coming out of either ventricle um, and it's going to be a useful way as we useful thing to talk about when we're talking about control of blood pressure and stuff in the body. So flow, liters per minute. Um, another thing we will talk about is resistance to flow. So resistance to flow is something that makes, makes it harder for the blood to flow at a certain, in fact, actually, before we get to resistance, let's get to pressure. So pressure, this is the force that drives the flow. And the basic idea, if I have some pipe or vessel or something, and there's some pressure here and some other pressure here, if there is a higher pressure here than there is pushing this way, the bulk flow is gonna be in that direction. So we always kind of look at what is the difference in pressure from one side to the other side. If there's no difference in pressure, there's no blood flow, right? If, there's, if both sides are pushing just with the same force, there's not gonna be any flow. But if I, for instance, I have my ventricle squeezing really hard over here and creating a really large pressure and there's not as much pressure on the other side, then the blood's gonna move that way. So pressure is basically the overall force that makes the blood flow. You know, in the cardiovascular system, the main thing generating this pressure is gonna be the contraction of the cardiac muscle in your ventricles, generating this force that creates this pressure that is making the blood flow. So we will be looking at blood pressure, I'll just be saying BP all the time. And again, we'll be talking about sometimes local, local pressure. Um, and I'll, sometimes we'll be talking about the big overall, often we'll talk about MAP, mean arterial pressure. This is kind of overall systemic pressure. So mean arterial pressure, when we start, we're gonna see that more. It's like, what is the pressure that is being generated here to drive the blood flow to the whole body? This is gonna be like, this pressure here is gonna be our mean arterial pressure are systemic, you know, and again, we're going to be sometimes looking at pressure locally when we do like local auto regulation of blood flow. But when we're looking at the big picture things that affect your blood pressure and stuff, we'll be talking about like mean arterial pressure and we'll be talking about cardiac output, you know, the flow coming out of the whole system. Um, so Blood pressure is going to be super important. It's just basically force per unit area. Um, the final thing we need to talk about is resistance to flow. So you can have some pipe and some pressure that's driving some flow. Um, but for any given pressure, the amount of flow is going to depend on how easy it is to get through that pipe. What, so, so the thing that the resistance to flow, 
is the thing that is keeping the, that's fighting the pressure that wants to move the blood forward. A lot of it happens just between the friction with the walls of the pipe, the walls of the vessel. As the blood flows, the blood nor, near the middle is in what we call laminar flow, is just kind of moving with very little resistance. But the blood that is making contact with the walls of the vessel experiences resistance, and that resistance, or friction, I should say, friction, and that friction causes resistance to flow. So what kind of things are going to affect resistance to flow? Uh, blood vessels, uh, um, width, if it's thin or more wide. Yeah, so like, the diameter. So she's the diameter of the vessel makes a huge, huge difference. All right, so if I, let me just get onto another page so it'll be easier. So. So intuitively, this will make sense. If I have, let's say some smaller thing here, let's say it has a resi Actually, let's make it, let's start with a bigger one. We have some big pipe and here we have some small pipe. In fact, let's, let's do a few different. Let's have this one has a diameter of R this has a diameter of one half R, whoops. This one has a diameter of one third R. So here I have three pipes um, with different radiuses. R is just radius. And I have blood flowing through. Just intuitively, the smaller the pipe is, the larger proportion of the blood is going to be experiencing resistance compared to the blood that's going through that smooth laminar flow. So it's going to make sense that the smaller the pipe is, the higher the resistance is, because a larger amount of the blood is in this relation, resistance relationship friction with the side versus the stuff that's just smooth down the middle. The relationship, so it's obviously going to be an inverse relationship, right? If we're looking at resistance to flow, which I'm going to do R. And I'm looking at the, at the relationship. It's going to be something in an inverse relationship to the radius of the tube. So that makes sense, right? The smaller the tube, the larger the resistance. But it's way more intense than that. So the law, I'm forgetting the, the dude's name now. Um, so hold on one sec. I, I should I kind of feel I should have his name because he has a name. The basic rule is it's proportional to the inverse of the fourth power of the radius. So what is what is what is what does it mean to take something to the fourth power? So in this case here, if I have let's say the resistance to flow with radius r is resistance r big r. So I have resistance big r in this case. If I have half of the radius, what is the effect going to be on the resistance to flow? What is one half to the fourth power? The sixteenth. Six, yes, and it's the inverse of that. This is going to be sixteen times R for my resistance. So even though it's just half the diameter, it's sixteen times the resistance. What about this case? One third R. What's the resistance going to be? What is three to the fourth? 
come on, somebody. Don't use a count. Isn't it 81? It's 81, right? To the fourth power is just three times three times three times three. And if you want to get you want to get clever, it's like, oh, it's three times three times three times three, three times three times nine, it's nine times nine, that's 81. Um, this is 81 times the resistance. So there's this really strong relationship between the diameter of the vessel and the resistance to flow. Um, this is going to be a key factor in controlling blood pressure and blood flow is by adjusting the diameter of vessels. You don't have to change them very much to have a dramatic um, effect on the resistance to flow. So resistance versus diameter, super important. And again, this is gonna come up a bunch, both when we look at flow and we will look at pressure. So make sure you, have, you understand, like the smaller the diameter, the larger the resistance to flow. Um, what other things can affect resistance? So resistance um, is proportional to one over the fourth power of the diameter. So it's, I should, so it's proportional to the inverse of the diameter or, or radius of the pipe. What other things are gonna affect resistance? I'm like the viscosity of the fluid. So say it one more time, Morgan. The viscosity of the fluid. Totally. Right, viscosity, kind of how um, thick. Think about if you have, you know, you've got, you're at McDonald's or in and out or something, and you're sucking down a milkshake. Versus, you know, and you have the exact same straw and you're sucking down a Coke. You got to have suck a lot harder to suck up a milkshake than a Coke through that same diameter straw because the milkshake is more viscous. So viscosity, higher viscosity is going to increase resistance to flow. And, you know, that's one of the things that you actually have to worry about. If your hematocrit is, gets too high, you have too much blood cells compared to the amount of plasma that can actually make the blood viscous and hard to pump around because it's got more resistance because it's more viscous. You know, in general, we aren't, we aren't gonna worry about the viscosity of the blood very much in our class. Um, I'll mention just very super briefly, viscosity of blood is complicated. Um, the study of the viscosity and flow of blood is they call it blood rheology. Um, it's nonlinear. Um, it's not just like faster, you know, it, it gets, it changes based on a lot of factors. Um, when blood slows down, the blood cells actually have this kind of electrostatic attraction and they actually start kind of lining up like little stacks of lifesavers. It's called um, Rouleau. They're actually kind of pretty. Um, so, and that's going to make it even more viscous because the blood is all kind of forming into these little rouleau. But as soon as the blood starts moving more, the rouleau break apart. And now it's just little blood cells. And all of a sudden you've got this nonlinear shift into being less viscous. So just kind of putting it out there, blood viscosity is complicated and be, beyond the scope of this class. Um, the other thing that we will talk about is just the total length of vessels. So diameter of a particular vessel affects resistance as we've just talked about. Viscosity of your blood affects resistance, although we aren't gonna talk about. And the total length of vessels. Um, again, because going through vessels means you have resistance with the walls of the vessels because of the friction. If we go all the way back to our systemic versus um, back. systemic circuit 
versus pulmonary circuit. Which side here is going to have a longer, like more miles of blood vessels? Systemic. Systemic. Systemic, big time, right? Systemic has to go to every single part of your body, from the tip of your nose to the tips of your toes, to the, you know, to the edges of your ears, everywhere. Pulmonary circuit just goes out to the lungs and comes right back, right? It does, and the lungs are right there sitting right beside the heart. It doesn't go very far. It goes here and back. So if you look at the miles of blood vessels in the pulmonary circuit, it's way less. This pulmonary circuit is going to, so that if we look at systemic side, this is going to be like five times the resistance compared to the pulmonary circuit. Um, is it, I think it's five, three, is it three to five, something like that. Maybe I shouldn't like looking at my notes now to try to be double sure. Uh, yeah, I think it's actually three to five times the resistance. And we know that the flow is the same on both sides. So what does that mean about the pressure we're going to need to keep the flow going if the systemic side has way more resistance to flow? It's going to have to be quite a bit higher. We're actually going to need three to five times the blood pressure on the systemic side to keep the blood moving at the exact same flow rate so we don't get congestive heart failure. Um, so this is going to be an important thing to remember when we're talking about systemic circuit versus pulmonary circuit. Systemic circuit is going to have much higher blood pressure than the pulmonary circuit. Um, let me put a new page because this is looking horrible. We're looking at blood pressure. This is going to be much higher than the pulmonary because you don't need as much pressure to keep the flow. You know, this is the resistance to flow is going to be much higher because of the many more hundreds of thousands of miles of vessels. But what about the flow, the cardiac output? I, I can't hear. It's the same. The same. So make sure you keep that, you keep that straight. And in fact, we're going to see this is related that because there's more resistance, we need more pressure to have an equivalent flow. So don't get those, I promise you, like on your quiz, like, you know, in another couple of days, you'll have a question, something around this. You know, you need to understand the two sides, the left and right, the pulmonary and systemic have the same flow, the same cardiac output, but systemic has much higher blood pressure due to a higher resistance to flow. Um, so now that we have these concepts of blood pressure, of resistance, and of flow, we can put them together in the basic relationship, the equation that is going to drive everything else for our discussion of the cardiovascular system. Oop, and I got to, I'm going to erase all these because I need to. So there are two ways to describe this. Wait, what just happened? I got to clear this again. So I'm going to flow. So one way you can say is flow equals um, blood pressure over resistance. So if you think about this, this totally makes sense. Right? If you have all else being equal, you increase the pressure, 
you're going to increase the flow. You know, all else being equal, if you if you increase the resistance, you're going to decrease the flow. So that's why the R is on the bottom. It's an inverse relationship. So if I increase resistance, the flow goes down. If I increase the pressure, though, the flow goes up. So does this, this make sense? Um, I can rearrange it. Just if I uh, multiply both times times R, I get this. Blood pressure equals flow times resistance. Again, flow, when we're talking about the big picture will be cardiac output. Um, this equation is essential for all our discussions of control of your blood pressure. We are going to see all the ways that your body has to control your blood pressure depend purely on these two, well, not, not just on these, mainly on these two things. There's going to be one other important thing we're going to get into as well. But resistance and flow. When you're body wants to increase the blood pressure, it can increase resistance. We're going to see like one of the short term ways to bring your blood pressure up is to constrict a blood vessel, which increases resistance. Vasoconstriction can increase blood pressure because of this relationship. Another way we can increase blood pressure is by increasing the flow. One of the ways you have to increase blood pressure is Increase cardiac output, speed up your heart. Have more liters per minute coming out of the heart is going to increase your blood pressure. So we're going to see lots of different ways that your body controls blood pressure by both manipulating resistance to flow, mainly through the um, diameter of blood vessels, as well as by manipulating cardiac output. And that can happen in lots of different ways. It can be speeding up your heart rate, but can also be by changing the contractile strength of the cardiac muscle. It can be by changing the venous return back to the heart, which we'll talk about. But there's lots, so we're gonna see lots of ways for your body to manipulate cardiac output. Lots of, a few different ways to manipulate resistance. And those are ultimately gonna be in service of controlling your blood pressure. So this formula, and actually this formula, you need to really feel comfortable with. You know, so you wanna get them, particularly I find this one super intuitive, right? If you just think about the flow of water through a garden hose, if you increase the water pressure there's going to be more flow, more water coming out of the hose. If you, if you increase the resistance, but don't change the pressure, then it's not going to have as much water, less flow going through the hose. If you increase resistance and you want to keep the same flow, then you got to increase blood pressure, right? That's what's happening in the systemic circuit. Increased resistance, we need to increase the blood pressure to keep the flow from going down. So this relationship here is critical for understanding pretty much everything we're going to talk about for the rest of today and most of the next class. Um, the nice thing is these relationships should feel kind of intuitive from the electrical stuff we're talking about. Instead of electrical current, now we're talking about blood flow. Instead of resistance to electrical current, we're talking about resistance to flow. And instead of voltage, we're talking about pressure, blood pressure, but it's the same relationship. When we get to the respiratory system next week, the respiratory system is gonna have the exact same formula, except instead of blood flow, it's gonna be airflow. Instead of blood pressure, it's gonna be changes in air pressure on two sides of your trachea. Instead of resistance to blood flow, it's going to be resistance to airflow. And it's going to be affected by the diameter of the bronchioles going down into your lungs instead of the diameter of the blood vessels where the blood's coming. So these relationships 
should feel kind of intuitive beyond just the blood, the blood, the cardiovascular system. This is the same physical relationship of just flow due to some pressure. Whether you're talking about blood flow, airflow, or even flow of electric charge. So just kind of hopefully kind of encouraging you to develop kind of an intuitive feel how all these are just different versions of same kind of underlying relationship. Um, all right. So are there any questions about the basic physics of blood flow? You know, all, everything we've been talking about so far has been looking, I mean, the stuff I've just been mentioning about flow and flow versus diameter and relationships of flow and resistance and pressure. These are kind of the underlying kind of concepts that we are now going to bring into play, looking at the actual heart and the actual ventricles and the actual flow through the cardiovascular system and the blood control of blood pressure in the cardiovascular system. So I wanna make sure that there's no questions about this basic idea here. All right, so we are now going to finally get to the heart proper. Hey, come on, I wanna clear all my drawings. Come on. Here it is. All right. All right, so here, and again, the real heart doesn't look like this. The real heart, the aorta and the pulmonary trunk actually come out the top of the heart. But for the purposes of trying to um, just keep this schematic and make it kind of more intuitive in terms of function rather than anatomy, I'm leaving it like this. So we have our atria. Okay, let me get my proper, this is gonna be like my left, let me, this is my left atrium, my left ventricle, this is my right atrium, my right ventricle. Um, the basic idea for the blood flow is, the blood is returning from the lungs, this is from the lungs through my pulmonary veins. And again, remember the veins coming back from the lung are red, right? Pulmonary veins, they're returning to the heart, so they're veins, but they're red because the oxygen is in the, picked up by the hemoglobin. So it's a vein, but it's bright red. Again, the pulmonary arteries going off to the lungs are blue because the blood that is returned from the systemic circulation, this is the vena cavae, which are coming back from the body, are gonna be blue. Even though the vena cavae are veins, it's, I mean, they're veins, they're blue, but pulmonary trunk is an artery and it's also blue. So just kind of make, don't, don't, I know a lot of times people get stuck with blue and red. All right. Um, to keep the flow going, we're going to put in some valves here, which we're going to actually have to talk about in our lab today. So this is a good a time as any to put them in. Um, to keep a one-way flow, there's going to be the atrioventricular valves. 
Um, the one that is on the left side, this is going to be the bicuspid or the mitral valve. Um, bicuspid. Bicuspid means it has two flaps, so it's kind of like saloon doors. Oh my gosh, hold on. So it's got these two flaps. You know, if, if I was looking at it from the top, they can either go in so you can go down through this way, but if you try to go back this way, they slam shut. So it's a one-way valve. Bicuspid means it has two flaps. Um, mitral, it looks like the bishop's, like a, if you look at the a bishop, he's got this hat where he's, it looks kind of like that. So that's why it's called a mitral valve, because it looks like a bishop's mitre, like the hat a bishop would wear. Um, the one on the right has three flaps. So it's going to be called the tricuspid valve. Those are going to make it so when the main contraction of the ventricles is happening, again, the ventricles are the main squeeze that are going to push the blood out to the body or the lungs. You don't want the backflow going back up into the atria. So these AV valves, the mitral and the tricuspid valve slam shut as the, um, as the ventricle squeeze. The ventricle squeezing, we call that systole. Systole is a contraction. So during ventricular systole, the AV valve slams shut. That's gonna be the beginning of that heartbeat sound. That look, 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 look. That look, the first part is the ventricles are squeezing and the AV valve slams shut to keep the blood from going back up. If these valves are leaking and there is some backflow, then you can hear, that's like a heart murmur. A heart murmur is when these valves leak and there's a bit of backflow back up into here. At least that's one way. We're going to see there's another valve as well that can murmur. Um, so the ventricles will squeeze, push the blood out to the body. Um, and then they have to relax and refill. When they relax and refill, they are going to have to deal with the fact that they just pushed lots of blood out to the body here. And there's a lot of pressure out here. And if the ventricles just relax, the blood is just gonna to try to smush back in from where you just pushed it out to. So there's gonna be another set of valves at the base of the aorta and the pulmonary arteries, which are called the semilunar valves. There's an aortic semilunar valve. And there is a pulmonary semilunar valve. So when we push the blood out into the body or out towards the lungs, then the ventricle can relax and refill. And as the ventricles relax, whatever pressure on this side can't get back up. It's not going to, we're not going to have this regressive blood flow back into the heart from the body. Um, this is going to be the second sound of the heartbeat, like the dup. You know, this is like, you know, the, these guys are the lup. If we're, if you're going like lup dup, lup dup, lup dup, lup dup. It's like every time the ventricles squeeze, then the bicuspid valve and the tricuspid valve slam shut. And then when the ventricles relax and start refilling, then the semilunar valve slams shut to make sure the blood doesn't come back from the body and the lungs. So that is the lupped up. And that happens pretty fast, like squeeze, lupped up. And then you've got to pause as the ventricles refill. And then it happens again, lupped up. And then the ventricles relax and refill. So that's kind of this big picture here. Um, you know, so we, the stuff we need to cover for the lab, I might as well just do right now, kind of the, 
let me let me think. I'm trying to think about the best way to kind of put this together. Um, yeah, let's let's talk a little more about this. I'm going to stay with the cardiac cycle, and then we're going to get back a little more into blood pressure. But I want to stay with the cardiac cycle since that's what we're going to be looking at in lab today. So this I've kind of drawn here. Um, let's do this in a little more. Oh, finally, no. All right, so. There's the heart. There's, let me, let me draw it a little better. So there's the heart. This is the myocardium, which we'll talk about a little later. Actually, it's worth talking about the myocardium just because we're going to actually have to bring it in as we talk about the electrical signaling in the heart here. So myocardium. Basically, the meat of the heart. This is going to be cardiac muscle. plus connective tissue, which helps strengthen and also we'll see electrically isolates different parts, plus what we call the fibrous skeleton of the heart. So myocardium, cardiac muscle, it does what you think it does. It squeezes. The fibrous skeleton of the heart provides structural integrity, particularly it anchors the, um, the valves, so the valves stay, um, stay strong, don't get ripped out as you're kind of pulling things. So this fibrous skeleton of the heart is kind of like right in here, anchoring the, anchoring the, um, the valves so they, they can hold, hold tight under the incredible pressures. The fibrous skeleton of the heart also electrically isolates the atria from the ventricles. And that's going to be critical when we get into the EKG in our lab today. So the fiber skeleton of the heart is a physical, physical strengthening. So it's structural integrity. Also important electrically, electrically isolates the atria from the ventricles. Um, this is going to be important because the cardiac muscle is going to be the same um, gap junctions between them like we saw in the smooth muscle. So remember we talked about a single unit smooth muscle. If you can excite one, you excite the whole bunch. It's the same thing with cardiac muscle cells. They're all connected with gap junctions. You excite one, the whole neighborhood gets excited. And so this Fibrous skeleton of the heart makes it so if you excite the atria, all of the atria get excited, but it doesn't automatically spread to the ventricles without a specific pathway that we're going to talk about. There's going to be this internodal pathway, but it's going to be um, important that we have a little delay. So when the atria contract, there's actually time for the blood to go from the atria to the ventricles before the ventricles start squeezing and pushing back up. So this structural integrity and electrical isolation are both going to be important. Um, other things, just you should know some basic um, terminology. Systole is contraction. Diastole equals relaxing. So we'll talk about atrial systole or atrial diastole or ventricular systole or ventricular diastole. And it just means 
is the muscle squeezing, contracting, or is the muscle relaxing and refilling? Um, and the basic way that this is going to work here is, in fact, let's just add in, we're going to talk about the electrical system that coordinates the heartbeat right now. And we're gonna, so they call it the intrinsic conduction system of the heart. Intrinsic meaning totally contained within. So if you've ever take, if, you, if you've ever gone fishing and gutted a fish right after you've caught it, you know, its heart is still beating in your hand. It's kind of freaky. You know, I can't do this because, you know, because we're not in class and I'm not a zombie, but if a zombie punched through your chest and ripped your heart out, the heart would keep beating in your hand for a little while. You know, the heartbeat is generated wholly within the, um, the tissue of the heart itself. It's very different. If you pull somebody's lungs out, the lungs would just sit there. They don't do anything on their own. But the heart keeps beating even without the rest of the body. You know, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system can speed it up or slow it down. But the core heartbeat and contraction of the ventricles and atria is happening purely within the um, system contained within the heart itself. And that's what we're going to talk about now. Up kind of in the wall of the right atrium, we're going to find the SA node, sinoatrial node. Also called the pacemaker node. So this little dude is autorhythmic. meaning it pulses on its own, whether or not it's getting any input from the outside. Um, so, back, you dirty dog. Hold on. So let's talk very briefly about cardiac muscle cells. The one that's connected by gap junctions, which I just mentioned, that's gonna be important. You excite one dude, you excite all its neighbors. But the other thing is that it's autorhythmic. What autorhythmic means is this. If I look at VM, the membrane voltage on a cardiac muscle cell. And if we think about, okay, there's some threshold where you're gonna have the action potential and the thing will, whoosh. so this is my threshold. You know, that minus 55. If I look at the voltage on a cardiac muscle cell, it has this current that just keeps drifting and then it hits threshold and goes boom, comes back. And then it just keeps drifting and it hits the threshold and booms and comes back. But so this little pacemaker potential you don't have to do anything. It will automatically, like every few seconds, it's gonna hit threshold again and fire off and contract and then drop back down, but then drift back up and hit threshold and fire. So that's what I mean, autorhythmic. You just sit here and watch it and it just keeps going. Um, and again, like your, your 
autonomic nervous system might be able to change the frequency, speed it up or slow it down, but the core autorhythmicity is just intrinsic in the cell itself. Um, autorhythmic, autorhythmic. Um, all of your cardiac muscle cells actually have this quality, but the pacemaker node goes faster than the rest and is gonna entrain the rest of the heart. So even though if you take a little chunk of atria or chunk of ventricles, it might, it will still kind of do autorhythmic behavior. It's pretty slow, more like 10 beats per minute. So what is gonna happen is that pacemaker node is gonna be doing this autorhythmic auto stuff. And it's gonna then drive the contraction of the rest of the heart muscle in a way that we're gonna talk about in a few moments. So, the other thing I'll mention before we leave cardiac muscle here, gap junctions, so it co-excites itself, autorhythmic. There's also this extended plateau in the action potential. You notice like most action potentials you draw it kind of goes up and down in a millisecond. In the cardiac muscle, it takes about 200 milliseconds before the action potential is done. Um, they think this helps prevent um, tetanus. Like, so if the heart start, if the heart can't go into that until the heart muscle just holds and doesn't let go, which would be obviously a disaster because you're not, you're not beating anymore. So, but in the interest of time, let's just leave that, leave that autorhythmic gap junctions. Those are the things we need to really pay attention to as we get into the systemic, I mean, the intrinsic conduction system of the heart here. So sinoatrial node, autorhythmic, autorhythmic at a higher rate than any of the other cardiac muscles. So it's gonna drive everything else. Um, let's put in the other node, which is kind of right here, kind of right near, this is called the AV node, which actually, and it's gonna have all sorts of fibers that help spread the excitation to the ventricles. This is called the bundle of his. These are the bundle branches. These just help the excitation spread quickly, right? And we'll talk about this more. Basically, yes, myocardium, Cardiac muscle has gap junctions and the spread will eventually reach everything, but it's kind of slow. Like this has to excite its neighbor, has to excite its neighbor, has to excite its neighbor, has to excite its neighbor. These bundle of hiss and bundle branches and Purkinje fibers, there are these specialized cells that spread the excitation quickly. So all the ventricular muscle can get excited kind of to quicker and together. Um, and then finally, we're going to need the intranodal pathway, this little delay line, which we're going to talk about as well. Kind of op point one to op point two second delay. So now we have actually, yeah, I think, yeah, let me just finish this thought. And then we will take our break here. The basic way that the cardiac cycle works is this. The heart has been relaxing. Both the atria and the ventricles are relaxing. So everything is just kind of refilling. Ventricular diastole. Eck. So let me use my pen tool because it'll be prettier. So when this all starts, so this is when the Blood is returning from the body through the vena cava, 
when the blood's returning from the lungs through the pulmonary veins, and it's coming back to the heart. Most of it is flowing right through the atria and coming into the ventricles. So it's just going in, refilling. Now, the next thing that's gonna, whoop, to the SA node fires off. That's gonna be basically the start of the heartbeat. When it fires off, that excitation is gonna spread throughout the atria. It won't get to the ventricles automatically because of that um, electrical isolation from the fibroskeleton. So this is gonna cause atrial systole. which, so any last blood that is in the atria, like I said, maybe 15% of the total volume that eventually ends up in the ventricle is still there. So atrial, atria contract, they'll squeeze and squeeze the last bit of blood from the atria down into the ventricles. Three, you know, after the R.1 to R.2 second delay, you know, due to that internodal pathway. You then excite the AV node. So after the SA node goes off, there's that little, and we dump the blood from the atria into the ventricles. And again, we can do that because the ventricles are not squeezing yet. If the ventricles were squeezing, they push back. You wouldn't be able to get it into the ventricles. So that's why there has to be this delay. Then what happens when the AV node fires off? It goes down the bundle of hist and contracts the ventricle. Uh-huh. This is going to call ventricular systole. So ventricular systole, the ventricles start squeezing. Um, like I said, if you didn't have those Purkinje fibers, the bundle of hiss and the bundle branches, it would still contract, but it would be kind of slower, like But because you have these bundle branches, the excitation spreads even faster. So there's this really strong, um, kind of more instantaneous contraction. When we get to the EKGs later in this after this morning, you'll see what happens if you have bundle branch block. You can actually see that on the EKG as the excitation gets more kind of spread out. Um, so ventricular systole, once the ventricles squeeze, there's two things that happen. When the ventricles start squeezing, does the blood immediately go out into the body, do you think? So it doesn't. So the thing that you have to remember here is, remember we have the aorta here. Let's just stay on the systemic side to make life easier. We're gonna send blood out and we have the semilunar valve here, the semilunar valve. But as the heart starts squeezing, there is blood pressure on the other side in your body. When your heart is, is relaxed, you still have what we call the diastolic blood pressure pushing back. Um, and we're gonna talk about this in more and more detail, but basically you have this diastolic blood pressure pushing back as the heartbeat starts and it's pushing against the other side of the semilunar valve. So the ventricle starts squeezing it doesn't actually move any blood yet until it can get greater than the diastolic blood pressure and push the blood out, right? So I can push on a swinging door, but if someone's pushing back at me harder, it's not gonna open. So when we start ventricular systole, the first thing that happens is what we call isoventricular contraction. Not, not, not iso isovolumetric contraction. 
ISO means same volume metric, means the same volume. So we are squeezing and building up pressure, but nothing is leaving the heart yet because there's more pressure pushing back from the um, ar arterial side. So we can't actually push it out. So B is, you know, once you overcome the diastolic pressure, then we get what's called ventricular ejection. That's when the blood finally squirts out of the ventricles off into the aorta and off into the pulmonary trunk. Right? So th th does that make sense? Um, um, I have a quick question. Uh -huh. um, when you say overcome the diastolic pressure, um, are you talking about in the or like the aorta or back in the like left atrium or no diastolic pressure is in the in, in fact let me draw let me show this will be the last thing i will do and then we'll take our break um So let's, let's stay just on the systemic side because it's easier. So here's my person, my systemic circulation. I'm coming back over here, back to the heart. So and we need to put in our little semilunar valve here. So when the heart is beating during ventricular systole, squeezing, pushing out, that makes sense that there's blood pressure when the ventricles are squeezing. When the ventricles are in diastole, your blood pressure doesn't go to zero, right? You know, it's not like blood is moving and then all of a sudden blood has zero pressure and blood is just sitting there and then the heart beats again, now it's moving, and then the blood stops completely when the heart's refilling. Instead, what happens is, while the ventricles are squeezing, you know, if I'm looking at my overall blood pressure, you know, I'm looking at, and let's look in the large artery here, like the aorta and the large arteries, blood pressure, which is gonna be measured in millimeters of mercury. During the ventricular systole, the pressure is gonna be pretty high. We call this my systolic pressure. But while that's happening, these large arteries like the aorta and the pulmonary trunk, these are these, the aorta is el very elastic. Um, we call them elastic arteries. There's a lot of elastic tissue. It's like a big rubber hose, really big, like the size of a garden hose made out of latex or thick latex. And as you are having this systolic blood pressure from the heart actually squeezing and pumping. You are also expanding this big rubber tube. This rubber tube is getting stretched out. So during diastole, now during diastole, the heart is just lying here, fallow. It's just refilling. Nothing's happening here. It's not pushing. But the aorta, and again, also the pulmonary trunk, they have stretched way out and now that elasticity is gonna push back and continue to propel the blood and keep, so yes, the pressure is gonna be less, but the diastolic pressure is not zero at all because the elasticity of these large arteries leaving the heart are continuing to propel the blood. So again, if you've ever, I mean, when I was a kid, we had these things called water weenies which were these um, basically big elastic tubes and you filled them at a garden hose and they would, this narrow tube would turn into a big fat tube full of water under a lot of pressure. 
And then you go, or it's the second time I'm going to talk about drenching your friends with water. You know, you can, you take a latex hose, you fill it with water, and now it's under a lot of pressure and it's really pushing. And then you let it out and it all squeezes. And so during diastole, there's a lot of pressure here continuing to propel the blood through the body, but it's also pushing back at the semilunar valve, trying to get back into the ventricle. So that is the diastolic pressure that you have to overcome before, during the next cardiac cycle. So we have the next cardiac cycle, the ventricle starts squeezing and pushing, but there's also diastolic pressure pushing back. So until we overcome that, then we're in that isovolumetric contraction, building up pressure, more and more pressure, Finally, we overcome this and now ventricular ejection, where you actually are pushing new, new heartbeat of blood out into the body. So th th does that make more sense? Yeah. Okay. There's one last um, thing I want to talk about in terms of the kind of the core background about kind of the you know cardiac output. So when we start talking about control of blood pressure on Thursday, you have all of the tools that you need to kind of understand that. So before we actually start the lab, I am going to do just a little more lecture material. And in particular, we're gonna talk a little more about cardiac output. Um, so let's do that. Um, okay. So cardiac output, which I've already mentioned last a little bit ago. This is the flow, again, in liters per minute out of either the left or right ventricle. And again, it has to be identical in the both of them because of the fact that if you don't, you kind of build up back pressure on one side or the other. Um, so if we think about, here's the heart, let me draw it in red. So the flow that's leaving there is gonna depend on two things. So cardiac output, we usually say CO. Cardiac output is gonna depend upon how much blood actually gets squeezed out during the heartbeat. And that's gonna be called stroke volume. So stroke volume This is liters per beat. This is how much blood is getting squeezed out of either ventricle with a heartbeat. So stroke volume is just the ventricle squeezes how much blood left the heart into the body or towards the lungs. So, and so the liters per minute is just gonna be how many liters per beat are coming out, you know, times your heart rate, right? Heart rate, this is heart rate. Oops. Yeah, so actually, let me just, so stroke volume. Again, this is liters per beat. cardiac output is going to be stroke volume liters per beat times your heart rate, which is basically beats per minute. And the beats cancel out, and we're going to end up with the liters per minute that are coming out of either ventricle. 
So this is another, when we're talking about formulas that you need to know and understand, this is another one that's gonna be at the core of understanding how the body controls blood pressure. Because if you remember, remember blood pressure equals cardiac output times resistance. This was something we were talking about earlier. And I was saying like, if you wanna control your blood pressure, you can control the resistance, which we saw you can control by changing the vessel diameter, vasoconstriction, vasodilation. You can also control blood pressure by controlling cardiac output. So cardiac output is now further broken down into stroke volume and heart rate. Um, and so we have to understand this because these are gonna be modulated to control blood pressure ultimately because blood pressure is dependent on cardiac output. So heart rate is the easy one. Heart rate is simple. Heart rate is just the beats per minute. You can speed up the beats per minute, slow down the beats per minute. What, what division of your autonomic nervous system would slow down the heart? Parasympathetic. Yeah, parasympathetic. And in fact, um, remember I talked about how cardiac tissue has a, that autorhythmicity that I said, if I ripped your heart out of your chest, it would keep beating in my hand. Mm -hmm. um, the sinoatrial node, it's intrinsic. Um, um, tempo is about 100 beats per minute. So if, if you ripped somebody's chart out, heart out of their chest and just put it on the table, it would beat about 100 beats per minute until, you know, until it's dead. Or the less, less gruesome thing is if you cut the vagus nerve, the parasympathetic, parasympathetic innervation to your heart, it would speed up to about 100 beats per minute, which is its natural beat. Um, it's natural heart rate. The reason it's more around 60 or 70 when you're at rest is because you have this kind of tonic parasympathetic innervation that keeps it down. So heart rate controlled by the autonomic nervous system, speed it up, slow it down. Stroke volume, liters per beat. What kind of things can control the liters per beat? So this is gonna be yet one more equation for you all. Stroke volume. This is gonna be and let me describe this in just a moment. Let me get rid of this here. This is gonna be easier to type, so I'm gonna type. So, and wait, tag nab it. Um, well, you get it. And systolic volume is ESV. Um, maybe I can just write volume there. Volume. Um, so, and diastolic volume is just how much blood is in the heart when the heartbeat starts, right? Diastole is the relaxed and refilling for the ventricles. Diastole, the ventricles are refilling. So this end diastolic volume is how much blood is in the ventricle just as the heartbeat is starting. And systolic volume is what it sounds like. It's how much is left after we're done squeezing. You don't squeeze out every last drop. So end diastolic volume minus, this just means how much blood was in the ventricle when we started the heartbeat. We squeezed and squeezed how much was left that didn't make it out by the end of the squeezing that difference is the stroke volume. That's how much actually got ejected into the body. 
right? Did that, that make that clear? Um, typically, you know, values for this, this is about like 135 mils. This is about 65 mils. So this is about 70 mils overall. So this is typical. So a typical stroke volume is about 70 milliliters of blood get squeezed out with each heartbeat. So now we can put this all together. Stroke volume, about 70 mils per minute, wait, I'm sorry, 70 mils per beat is getting squeezed out. Cardiac output is gonna be the stroke volume times the heart rate. So if we look there, typical cardiac output, cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. Typical stroke volume we just said is about 70 mils per minute. Um, a typical heart rate, you know, if for youngsters like you all is probably less than this, but the average heart rate that people usually put in is about 70 beats per minute. This is kind of like a typical heart rate is about 70 beats per minute. So if we multiply this all out, you know, seven, what's seven times seven? 49. 49 or about five. You know, and we have to add, so about, it's about 50, add a couple of more zeros. So about 5,000 mils per minute. And 5,000 mils is just what? How many liters? Five. 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 So five liters per minute. This is a typical resting heart rate, I mean, resting cardiac output, I should say. When you're just sitting there right now, you sitting in front of your computer watching Zoom, both your right ventricle and your left ventricle are pushing out about five liters of blood per minute out to the body. Um, you can increase this. In fact, our lab next class, we're gonna see ways, like if you're exercising, if you're exercising and you need to have much higher blood flow because your muscles need way more oxygen to keep going. You can increase your cardiac output. So we have what's called cardiac reserve. So five times, you know, up to like seven times in conditioned athletes. Now, if you think about that, it's pretty kind of amazing. If a normal cardiac output is five liters per minute, this is saying that a person can have a cardiac output up to 35 liters per minute. That means 35 liters of blood coming out of either ventricle every minute. That's a huge flow. So what kind of things can your body do to increase cardiac output? Increase heart rate. Totally. One way is to increase heart rate. So if I increase heart rate, I'm gonna increase cardiac output. The other way is by increasing stroke volume. So increasing stroke volume, there is, it's a little more complicated now because stroke volume, as we saw, is this end diastolic versus end systolic and both of those can be manipulated. So let's look at that. Stroke volume, again, this is the volume per beat. And we said stroke volume is N diastolic volume minus N systolic volume. And I need to do a quick little battery deal so I don't lose you all. So if I wanted to increase, and again, cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. So if I want to increase stroke, increase cardiac output, I have to increase stroke volume. What are the two ways to increase stroke volume here? Increase and diastolic volume. 
Okay. I can either increase this or I can decrease this. Those would be two different ways to do it. Um, let's start with this one. This one's a little easier. Um, end systolic volume is just how much is left after the heartbeat is done. So if I squeeze harder, there'll be less left over. So what I can do is increase contractility of the heart, contractile strength of the cardiac muscle. Um, for instance, one thing that can do this is epinephrine. Um, cardiac muscle is different from, from skeletal muscle in that you can have graded strengths of contraction. If you have um, epinephrine around and you excite the cardiac muscle, more calcium would have gets, gets put into the cell than would have otherwise, and you'll have a stronger contraction. So the same excitation in the presence of epinephrine will make a stronger contraction than if there's no epinephrine. So that means like if you've got adrenaline around in your body, your heart is going to be squeezing harder under the same conditions. You'll have less left over because you've squeezed harder, which means the stroke volume is going to be higher because you've pushed more of the blood out, which means your cardiac output is going up. Does, does, does that make sense? This one's a little trickier here. Um, so here to understand how we increase end diastolic volume, we have to think about the whole circuit with the arteries and the veins. So here's a circuit, right? We have blood leaving the arteries going to the, to the body, blood coming back after it's given up its oxygen. You know, we're going to talk about this in much more detail, but basically the blood, most of the blood at any time is, the majority of it is sitting in your veins, kind of slowly percolating back under low, much lower pressure back to the heart. So typically you have a lot more blood here and less overall of the total blood volume is in the arterial side at any moment. But you can shift that proportion of blood in the arterial side to the venous side by contracting smooth muscle in the veins. So the vein has smooth muscle in it. So if I contract my veins, which means there's less overall place for the blood to be hanging out on that side, that's gonna push more of the blood onto the arterial side. So that balance of how much blood is sitting in the vein side versus the arterial side can shift. So when this is happening, this is gonna cause what we call increased venous return. So if I'm constricting this smooth muscle in the veins, that means more of the blood that's getting pushed out here is coming back into the heart rather than just hanging out in that voluminous space of all the veins. So increased venous return is like, oh my God, more blood is coming back to the heart during diastole. So this is gonna cause an increase in the end diastolic volume which will then cause an increase in stroke volume, which will then cause an increase in cardiac output, right? So this is another way to ultimately increase cardiac output is by increased venous return, which causes an increase in stroke volume, which causes an increase in cardiac output. Does, does, does that make sense? Um, while we're here, I'll add in the last piece of information before we go into the lab, and it's called the Frank Starling Law of the Heart. <laughs> 
So the idea of the Frank Starling law of the heart is that however much blood you're returning to the heart, it's going to be able to pump out. So if we increase the venous return, it's not just going to start inflating the heart. It's going to get pushed out to the body on the next heartbeat, right? Because you could have an increased re venous return and just have the heart start inflating because you're, if, you, if you're not increasing the amount you're pushing out, you're actually going to start start getting uh, you know, inflating. So the Frank Starling law of the heart is basically this idea that the heart will be able to pump out any of the blood that's returned to it. So if you increase the venous return, it will send more blood out on the next beat. Um, the way it works is the same way we've talked about how smooth muscle was triggered by stretch. If you pre-stretch the, car the cardiac muscle and excite it, it will actually contract stronger on the next time you excite it. So I talked about over here, you can increase contractile strength with epinephrine, also pre-stretching. So if I'm if the muscle is pre-stretched because I've increased my end diastolic volume, it's going to squeeze even harder, and that's going to make sure we push out all that blood that we brought back to it. So that is that Frank Starling law of the heart, and it's two guys. So there was a guy named like two car one cardiologist named Frank, another guy named Starling that worked to come up with this. It's because it sounds like a one dude but it's two dudes. Um, so any questions about the Frank Starling Law of the Heart? Not about Frank, but um, the end systolic volume would it also, like if you're an athlete too and you're working those muscles more, would that also contribute to the end systolic volume because you have increased like capacity of, does that work at all like with your heart muscles that they're being worked more? Wait, so I, I'm not sure I understood your question. Say that again. Or like for the increasing of the stroke volume, the version, the first part that we're talking about, the end systolic volume that you said, the increased contractile strength and through like epinephrine was one example. Would it also be if you're an athlete and you're like using those muscles more in the heart that it would have increased capacity to have end systolic volume be higher? Um, I'll think about how to phrase the question and ask it. Later. I'm not sure. Let, let's get back to that because I do okay. want to keep moving. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, all right. So next class, what we're going to do is again really focus on blood pressure, which we talked about cardiac output times resistance, and then we can talk all sorts of ways. Again, resistance goes up will increase blood pressure. Cardiac output going up will increase blood pressure, but that could be increasing the heart rate or increasing end diastolic volume or decreasing end systolic volume, which are both working to increase stroke volume. So you can see how we're starting to put all these pieces together, which then you're going to have to connect. Um, so, you know, while you're studying this stuff, start learning the individual pieces, but then kind of keep in mind that when we start to understand blood pressure control, you have to understand how all these different things we're talking about all interrelate to each other. Um, and there's a, a couple of other things that are gonna affect blood pressure, like especially particularly blood volume, but we'll talk about that next class. Um, so, what we're gonna do now is, let's see, look at the time. We're all good. I'm gonna introduce the lab. Okay. The EKG lab. So this is just gonna build on all the stuff we've just been talking about in lecture. And so what I'm going to do is first 
going to describe what exactly is the EKG or you know, EKG, ECG, it's the same thing. Electro, the C is cardiogram, just like electroencephalogram, electromyogram, um, electrocardiogram, the electrical activity that you can measure on the skin that's due to the depolarization of the sarcolemmas on the cardiac muscle, basically. Um, K electrocardiogram is just German, cardio with a K, right? It's this EKG, ECG is, it's just, you know, pooch or dog. It's just two words for the same thing. Um, and the basic idea, you have to kind of go back to that cardiac cycle that we were talking about. So again, we talked about here's the heart. And we have the sinoatrial node, the little pacemaker node, the internodal pathway, and then the AV node. And I said the internodal pathway is like an op point one to op point two second delay. So again, if you don't have that, basically what's going to happen when the SA go, node goes off, the SA node is going to excite all of the atria. And that's going to cause atrial systole. But it doesn't automatically go down to the ventricles because we have this, I talked about that um, insulation from the fiber skeleton of the heart. So when that SA node goes off and the atria depolarize, you can measure it on the skin. There's a bump. Let me make it not quite as fat. Atrial depolarization, we're gonna call this the P wave. Again, that is just the voltage you can measure on the skin that is a result of the depolarization of all the atrial muscle during the beginning of the heartbeat here. What's going to happen next? Ventricular, the... ventricular depolarization? Repolarization. Yeah. So what's going to happen is we have that delay through the internal pathway. Then we fire off the AV node, which is gonna excite the ventricle muscles and make the ventricles contract. And then we're gonna have ventricular depolarization, which is way more dramatic because there's a lot more muscle here. And it's gonna create this big mess called the QRS complex. So it's the QRS complex. And this is gonna be from ventricular depolarization. And I think I was, Stephen was saying, the atria do repolarize, but it's pretty, the, the effect is small compared to the QRS complex and it's about this in the same time. So, the atrial repolarization gets lost in the QRS complex. You don't actually see it. So the atria are relaxing here and there is an electrical effect, but it's not visible because it's swamped by the QRS complex. And then the ventricles repolarize and you get a little bump and that's called the T wave. Um, it's a little counterintuitive that it's bumping up. Um, it's because you're not, if you were actually sticking electrodes in the heart muscle, it would go up and down. But because you're measuring on the skin and it's just this complicated relationship of this heart within this big bag of salt water and you're measuring on the surface of the bag of salt water, um, this is what it looks like. You just have to 
be all right with this is what it looks like. And it can look, depending on where you're measuring, these bumps can be bigger or smaller or inverted, but this is the basic idea of a EKG. It's for the heart, it goes brrr, P wave as atria go, boom. QRS as the ventricles go, T wave as the ventricles repolarize. Um, and then it just keeps going. It's like boom, boom, boom. And then you wait, this is diastole, right? And then it starts again, the SA nib goes off atria, boom, boom. And then it just keeps, so it just, until you're dead, it just keeps going. Um, there's something like 3 billion heartbeats in your lifetime. Right, from the moment you are in utero and you're a ball of cells that's too big for diffusion, you've got a really primitive heart that's already starting to um, supply all the nutrients and oxygen to your cells as you develop as a pre-embryo and as a fetus. And obviously it doesn't stop till the day you're dead. It just keeps beating, beating somewhere around 70 beats per minute for like the next 90 years if you're lucky. Um, you know, so on average, it's somewhere around 3 billion heartbeats in your lifetime. It's kind of amazing that it goes that long without like going, you know, stopping. Um, so this is what we're going to be measuring on the lab today. Basically, you take a person. There are different ways to measure EKG. Um, there's just the, the three lead version that we're going to do where you put something on one hand, one wrist, the other wrist, and on your ankle. Um, and even there, there are different, you can either look across or from one leg or across. There's, and each one can show you different things, can show you about the orientation of the heart inside the chest. Um, when people do more formal EKG analysis, there's this 12 lead analysis where they put like a bunch of little leads on your chest and get even more detail about what's going on. Um, for our lab, we are just putting the electrodes across your wrists and looking at what's the voltage difference across here. You know, and it's going to look something like that. It's the voltage measured on your skin that is being generated as your heart muscle depolarizes and repolarizes. So if you are a if you're trained in it, you can actually tell quite a bit about how the heart is doing and you can make implications about other things about the heart as well. But ultimately it doesn't tell you anything other than the electrical activity. You know, it could be the heart really isn't pumping at all. If like it's completely scarred up, you might have electrical activity, but nothing's moving, who knows? I mean, that's probably, un it's not, not, but just to let you know, it's purely electric. Tamponade is so. Ta I'll talk about that. That would be that would be a good reason why you'd have PEA. Right. So tamponade is this, and let me. In fact, I can show that really quick. Um, a good heart. reason to have a normal EKG and no mechanical activity. All right. So then that makes sense. So here's your heart. Your heart is in a serous membrane. This little leathery bag here, and normally this is just this nice little thing with slippery fluid. So the heart can move and beat and isn't gonna be rubbing against all the stuff outside. So it's in this little leather bag again, which we'll talk about in a little more detail. This is called the pericardial sac. Cardiac tamponade is when you have fluid buildup in that sac. So something happens and you get fluid buildup in here and that is pushing and it's impairing the ability of the heart to actually fill properly. So it's what Morgan is saying here. The cardiac electrical activity is still going, but there's this physical impingement that's keeping the ventricle from actually filling properly. So this, this is called cardiac tamponade. If fluid or blood or something builds up in that pericardial sac and actually is impinging on the heart's ability to properly fill. Yeah, so thanks, thanks for that. Um, 
things that you can see, in fact, we often see in the class um, is this. This is actually a, so normally this is a normal heart rate, heartbeat. So this happens every once in a while. So what's going on here? We go P, Q, R, S, T. P, Q, R, S, T. P, oh my God, then P, Q, R, S, T. You know, the heart missed a beat. So the P means the atria depolarized, but the ventricles didn't on this particular beat that we missed. What would cause that to happen? So let, let's do a normal beat. Let's do like the PR interval here. Normally the P goes off, that's the atria. R, this is kind of the ventricles are fully contracting. What is this time from the P to the R here? Point 0.2 seconds. Exactly, point 0.1 to point 0.2 seconds. It's that, this, that time difference from when the AV node fires to when the, not the, the, the SA node fires off, that's gonna trigger the atria. And then the AV node fires off after that little internodal pathway. So if you have a problem with that internodal pathway and it doesn't always conduct to excite the AV node, then you can get this, you know, can miss, miss the beat if internodal pathway, you know, doesn't, you know, talk to the AV node. So this, this actually happens. Um, again, doing this lab for many years, we often actually see this in students, not often, but every once in a while you see it. You know, as long as it's just once in a while, it doesn't matter, right? It's just every once in a while the heart skips a beat, but then it gets back on its rhythm. So this is one thing that we actually sometimes do see in this class. Um, another thing, and, and when we're doing our lab today, I'll be giving you data, um, I think it's from Becky, you know, and when you're annotating things, in addition to making sure you recognize what's the P, what's the QRS, what's the T, and what do they stand for? What are the, what's happening there? You're also gonna annotate this PR interval. Make sure you understand what's going on there and what that timing is there and why that's important, right? Because this is the P goes to the QRS after that small delay. Why is it important that there's a delay between the P and the QRS? So the atria and the ventricles don't contract together. Exactly. During this atrial contraction, that's when we're pushing the blood from the atria to the ventricles. If the ventricles were pushing at the same time, they would just be pushing back and you couldn't transfer the blood. So this gives you a little time to move the blood from the atria to the ventricles before the big daddy rabbit contraction happens and the ventricles that are gonna push the blood out to the body. So that, that makes sense? Um, another thing that we see in the class every once in a while is this. This kind of QRS gets all spread out. What would cause that? Bundle branch block. Yeah, this would be like from bundle branch block. Again, if we go back to this idea of Here's the heart and the cardiac. Here's the, we talked about the SA node, the little delay to the AV node. Um, when the AV node goes off, I talked about it quickly 
spreads the depolarization through the cardiac muscle, through these Purkinje fibers, through what we call the big bundle of Hiss and the bundle right and left bundle branches that basically carry the depolarization quickly to all reaches of the ventricles. So all those cells kind of are, are contracting quickly together. If the bundle branches are having problems, then this fires off. We will still have ventricular contraction, but it is going to be slower. It's like these cells contract, which contract to these cells, which talk to these cells, which talk to these cells, which talk to these cells. So it's gonna be a much more drawn out production to ultimately excite the, all of the cardiac muscle of the ventricles if the bundle branches aren't working properly, which is why in the EKG, you end up having this kind of spread out QRS because the time for the ventricles contract is elongated because it takes more time to be, to, to excite it all. If the bundle branches are all working well, then you're really quickly spreading that excitation and you get this nice tight QRS. So, are there any questions about all of this? Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna do the first part, you know, do the first part of the lab. Basically, normally, again, this is something next semester or the semester after, if we're actually on campus again, and you actually wanna watch your own EKG, let me know and we'll hook you up to the machine and you can actually watch your EKG and see what it looks like. You know, I've mentioned that with blood work as well. I feel bad that you guys aren't actually getting to do this for real. You're just getting to watch us, you know, the teachers do it. Um, but that's what we got, you know. Um, so what we're gonna do now, I'm gonna share my screen. Well, let me see the time. It is 11. We came back. So let's, let's take another, let's take one more little break. Let's take a, like a fifth, let's come back in 10 minutes and then we'll continue just so, then we'll actually start the lab. So we'll come back at 10.15.